um, I want to invite Chad to come on up, and he has the, uh, the time for us. And Chad, we are all ears with open hearts as well, what you have to say. Well, good morning. I guess that way woke us all up, huh? Hope you're doing well. It's a beautiful day outside, and I'm excited to share our next presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. And this one is the gut-brain connection. We're going to be looking at health and happiness connected with the gut. And I have a YouTube channel called Health and Olmstead. Do I not? Maybe I didn't set my computer on to the Apple TV. Let me just find that again. System preferences. Yep. I must have turned off when I should it. All right. There we go. There it is. All right. Well. Let us, we will get started. We're going to start talking about something in the Bible. We're going to talk about Daniel and the gut-brain connection. Here is a book called The History of Epidemiologic Methods and Concepts, looking at the history of the study of disease. And the, it says in this book that Daniel chapter 1 is possibly the first clinical trial in all of recorded history. This here is taken from the National Institutes of Health where they cover all kinds of, you know, they have just compilation of studies and journals and so forth. But this is a looking at from, from uh, perspectives in clinical research, the evolution of clinical research, not evolution, but just the study of the history of medicine in this particular situation, the growth of medicine over the years. And it says there, 562 B.C., the world's first clinical trial is recorded in the book of Daniel in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? That the first scientific study that we know of in all of history is found in the book of Daniel. And it's in Daniel chapter 1. We mentioned that in the last presentation where Daniel's taken from Jerusalem to Babylon as a captive, put through a three-year educational system, and he's given the best food that the king can give to them, his own food, the food from his own table, the best meats, and historically, that would be considered to be the best food. But Daniel, it says in chapter 1, verse 8, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not just defile himself. And then what happened? This is where Daniel, this is the first scientific study in all of recorded history. It says, test your servants, I beg you, Daniel said, for 10 days. This is a 10-day trial, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And we shared in the last presentation that a scientific study was done, they called it the Daniel Fast, where people went from a standard American diet to this diet for 10 days to see what would happen. They would eat more carbs, and what happened to their blood sugar? Did they go up or down? They went down. Their blood lipid levels went down. They became healthier in just 10 days. And what was the result of this? What was the result of Daniel and his friends going on this diet? Daniel 1, verse 18 to 20 says, Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel's friends, also called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Now think about that. Here's Daniel and his friends, and what ended up happening with them is that they, what they ate impacted their brain, and they were actually able to think better, so much better, that their intellect was better than all the wise men in Babylon. This is absolutely fascinating. 
So what they ate, what went into their gut, impacted their brain. The first study in all of recorded history is a study on the impact of the gut-brain connection. Now I'm going to show you a video clip from a documentary my wife and I made a number of years ago called Ancient Health. It'll start off with Dr. McDougall once again, and then we'll be multiple different health professionals. So we'll listen to this. But the main thing that folks should be concerned about is how long you live and how likely you are to get disease. And there have been three major studies published on this subject, big meta-analyses. And these meta-analyses, and only three big ones have been published, they show consistently that low-carb diets, in other words, low plant food diets, high animal food diets, consistently they show that they're associated with more heart disease and more death, more mortality. If you look around the world and you look at these people in the blue zones, the, the average percentage of calories from carbs range from, ranges from about 50% to about 80%. It, carbs are not the enemy, refined carbs are the enemy. Uh, there have been a number of recent studies. Uh, Dr. Beeshold uh, out of Phoenix, Arizona, first she did an observational study showing that plant-based diet actually significantly improves your depression and anxiety stress score. It's called a DASS score. So the mood actually is improved when you get the right amount of carbohydrates, but also the right type of carbohydrates and less protein. Then she followed up with an interventional study, and that's where she took people who are not on a plant-based diet and put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks. She also put them on a plant-based diet plus fish for two weeks to see which one would be superior. And it turned out the fish diet wasn't any more superior than the carnivore diet. But the plant-based diet, significant dramatic changes, statistically significant changes in just two weeks in their mental ability. We see when people go on this diet and drink plenty of water, get plenty of rest, follow these natural remedies, that they, it's just like something snaps in their brain and it doesn't take like weeks or months. Plant-based diet is key in our program for depression and anxiety recovery. The results are outstanding because it's a comprehensive approach, it's not just diet. We also utilize exercise and we're utilizing correct thoughts and a lot of different modalities. But the diet is a key element. I went on a plant-based diet about five weeks ago. It's amazing because I, even if they had, had not told me he had the diet change, the first thing I noticed was he was bringing his schoolwork in. And my teacher has actually been bragging on how much better I've been behaving since I've been on the diet. In class, he wasn't getting as distracted that he was paying attention, he was able to listen more closely, he was being alert, his discernment was better, uh, he was more diligent, everything. I can pay attention more, my mind is more clear since I've been on the diet. It's just a, a huge improvement. And I also noticed he lost a lot of weight, I mean, but the main things I noticed was behavioral. A study in a middle school has showed clearly that switching the menu from animal source to plant source diet, almost eliminated absenteeism, um, increased and in enhanced attention and homework performance and performance at school. It, it almost eliminated acts of violence as well as teen pregnancies. And so they just feel better. Everywhere the blood flows, everywhere that perfect circulation goes, they feel better. Not just in body, but in mind. Clears up their thoughts even. And every single day since I've been on a plant-based diet, the clarity continues to increase and my face continues to look younger and I, my body feels like I feel like I look more vibrant. I, I've looked at pictures of myself before and after and I look five years older, even just 10 months ago, than I do now. What we eat does get turned into neurotransmitters. It actually helps us or hurts us depending on what we're eating in regards to our brain chemistry and it plays a vital role in health of the brain. 
they'll say within three or four days, they, they seem to have clarity. They can, they're, they're alert. They, they, can, they listen in class better. They absorb more and they do better on their tests. The fog has been lifted out of my head. I think clear. I've got better ideas, I believe. Um, I, can, I can put two and two together faster. And just in general, I'm happier. In fact, diet alone, studies show that diet alone will reduce your depression and anxiety scores by half just by dramatically changing your diet to a plant-based. And so that's significant. Now we go for more than just half, and so that's why we have a whole program that, in, that includes more than this. Uh, but just the diet alone will make a big difference. You don't have to choose between high quality living and longevity. It's the same program. The same new start approach to living helps you live longer and it helps you live better. Close to what we would see in the Daniel diet, it helps these students. Notice it helped them in many different ways. It helped them do better in their schoolwork, in their classwork. It also helped them to, they were fighting less and it almost eliminated teen pregnancies, according to the doctor. This is incredible. So this is this gut-brain connection. And the Bible repeatedly talks about it. I'm only going to touch on, uh, we talked about Daniel 1, but also in Lamentations chapter 1, it says, Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress, my bowels are troubled. It's interesting that they notice that. We see in Jeremiah 4, verse 19, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. They noticed that there was this connection between what was going on in their gut and what was going on in the brain. Now, Galileo told us all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. He said the point is to discover them. Some things, they're very simple once you know them, but before you knew them, you didn't know them. And so we're going to look at this. We talked about last night that we have a, a, a nerve that connects our gut to our brain called the vagus nerve. And information travels, it's a bidirectional uh, you know, nerve where information is traveling both ways. Interestingly enough, 90% of the information traveling in this nerve goes from the gut to the brain, meaning your brain tells, your gut tells your brain significantly more than your brain tells your gut. Very fascinating. And this is from a book called Councils on Diet and Health, page 50. It says, the abuses of the stomach by the gratifications of appetite are a fruitful source of most church trials. Now, that sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. But we're going to look at some research here. It says, scientists have discovered that a high-fat diet leads to depressive, anxious symptoms in mice, and it also promotes inflammation. Now, I'm going to share with you, we're going to go from an animal study, and then we're going to look at a bunch of human studies. But notice, they put mice on two different diets. They put them on a high-fat diet, and then the ones on the high-fat diet begin to exhibit memory loss, inflammation, and repetitive behaviors like people would have in depression and anxiety. Often when you're depressed, you go over and over and over the same negative thoughts. So this, this is very common. The, they put the other group of mice on a standard fat diet, and they did not, not exhibit the same negative characteristics. Then what they did is they took the regular diet mice, and they took bacteria or microbes from the guts of the high-fat diet group, and they put those into the guts of the regular fat diet mice, and they began to exhibit anxiety, impaired memory, repetitive behaviors, and inflammation. So evidently, the bacteria that is in your gut can impact what is going on in your mental health. So this is really staggering. And we were told this in a book called Child Guidance, that eating too frequently, too much, and of rich, unwholesome food destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain, and perverts the judgment, preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. It says, it cannot be too often repeated that whatever is taken into the stomach affects not only the body, but ultimately the mind as well. It is difficult and often well-nigh impossible for one who is intemperate in diet to exercise patience and self-control. Fascinating. And we're going to look at some incredible research later this afternoon at our final session on foods that increase, can potentially increase anger, anxiety, depression, and even lust issues. Foods that can impact this. It's been life-changing for me, and I'm going to share with you some of my testimony on that. 
But this principle is actually a biblical principle. It goes back to 2 Peter chapter 1, 5, and 6, which says, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. It's these stepping stones of faith. After faith, virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, what's the next one? Patience. Notice that in order to be patient, the Bible says you need to be temperate. And so, for instance, it, let's, say, let's say you go to bed really late at night, husbands and wives. Are you as likely to be patient with your husband or your wife if you didn't get enough sleep last night? Probably not, right? So when we're intemperate, it's harder to be patient and to exercise self-control. And so we're going to talk more about this. Now, research shows, talking a little bit about overview of physiology of digestion, one of the key factors to feed our gut in a healthy way is to eat foods with fiber. What kind of foods have fiber? Someone said psyllium. Well, true, but what is psyllium? What is psyllium? It's a plant. And what, what foods have fiber are plant foods, unrefined plant foods. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, all of these things are filled with fiber. One thing that has zero fiber in it is any food made from an animal. There's no fiber in the animal kingdom. It is, it is a part of the structure of the plant itself. That's where the fiber comes from. And that fiber, what it does is it feeds the bacteria in our gut. It is what the bacteria in your gut like to eat, and you need that bacteria. And a diversity of gut bacteria is what you really need, and we're going to talk about how to get that. This is an article in Scientific American. The title of it is, Think Twice, How the Gut's Second Brain Influences Mood and Well-Being. Researchers are now calling the gut the second brain. Notice what they say in the article. The second brain informs our state of mind in other more obscure ways as well. A big part of our emotions are probably influenced by the nerves in our gut, like butterflies in the stomach, signaling in the gut a part, as part of our physiological stress response, Gerson says, is but one example. Although gastrointestinal or gut turmoil can sour your mood. Everyday emotional well-being may rely on the messages from the brain below to the brain above. Notice they're talking about that having a sour stomach can negatively impact your brain. Notice what we read here in a book called Councils on Diet and Health. People who have a sour stomach are very often of a sour disposition. Everything seems to be contrary to them, and they are inclined to be peevish and irritable. <clears throat> If we would have peace among ourselves, we should give more, more thought than we do to having a peaceful what? Stomach. This is exactly what the research is now showing us. The word peevish, by the way, is not a word that people use often. Today, but you know what it technically means? It means to be easily annoyed, especially with inconsequential, inconsequential issues. So... Have you ever been that way where the, the most minor thing makes you angry or annoyed? That's being peevish. And it could actually come from what's going on in the gut. I've had that. I can tell you I've had that. So research shows that two-thirds of your immune system, it might be even closer to 70% of your immune function, is found in your gut, in the bacteria in your gut. Very important. And here's talking about a study called, and they say, the surprising link between gut germs and toddler's tantrums. What did they find? What they found is that they looked at children, toddlers, that were happy and ones that were little curmudgeons, little unhappy, you know, children. And what they found is the ones who were happy and social and outgoing had a greater diversity of gut bacteria. The ones who were more antisocial and unhappy and, you know, kind of standoffish, those ones had less diversity of gut bacteria. Fascinating. Now, looking at this, so these, the ones who were happier had a greater diversity. So the question is, if you want a good ratio of bacteria in your gut, what should you do? Well, somebody might be thinking, well, maybe he's going to tell us to go get some supplements. That's not what I'm going to tell you. What are we going to find out? This is from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. 
headed out by Dr. Neil Barnard, who's done research with the United States government. And the title of this article is Vegan Diets Lead to Healthier Intestinal Bacteria. Now, what on earth is this all about? This means just plant foods lead to in healthier intestinal bacteria. Well, we already found that the fiber in the food, as we've mentioned, feeds the bacteria in our gut. But secondarily, things like, for instance, research has shown that an apple, in and on an apple, you have about 100 million different bacteria. And you may think, then I will never eat an apple again. No, it's, it, this is, by and large, good bacteria. Strangely enough, they found that if it's organic, it even has greater diversity. Now, if you can't afford organic, then non-organic is still better than any other thing because you, get, you get the most toxins. Most people get the vast majority of their toxins from animal foods because it's what's called biomagnification or higher levels because as a, even as a... As a uh, it, let's say it's, you know, a typical cow or whatever. It's eating all the quantity of grains or grass that it eats, and that biomagnifies because it's held up in the fat and in the tissues of the animal, and then it's biomagnified. But if we eat it in the plant, even if you're eating conventional type, you're getting way lower levels than you would typically be on an animal-based diet. But nevertheless, so vegan diets have healthier intestinal bacteria because if, if you eat an apple, you get those 100 million bacteria. But interestingly enough, a greater diversity is one of the most important things. They found that people who in one month eat 30 different plant foods, 30 different kinds of plants in one month, have the healthiest stomachs. Because if you only eat apples along with the other food that you eat, you'll only get the diversity of bacteria in the apple. But then if you, eat, if you add to your diet pears, you get another diversity of bacteria there. And then you add plums and peaches and, and kale and spinach and lettuce. You get an idea. Now your bacterial, what's called your microbiota, the, the pool of bacteria in your gut gets larger and larger and larger. The diversity especially gets larger and larger, I should say. But this fits perfectly with the, what the Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, where it says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food, right? God made this food for us. It was the food in the garden. And by the way, it's the garden of, what's it called? Eden. Do you know what the word Eden means in the Hebrew language in the Bible? It means pleasure. This was the garden of pleasure. So you could infer this without knowing all the research that we've just talked about, that whatever food God gave Adam and Eve in the garden of pleasure would bring about the most happiness to humanity, yes or no? That would make perfect sense. And as people, it's, it's not a sin. I mean, Jesus ate meat. Nobody's forcing you not to eat it. But it, the closer you get to the way God made Adam and Eve to live, the happier you statistically will be. We saw that in, uh, Dr. Nedley pointed that in two weeks, you can drop your levels of depression by 50% by going back to that Edenic diet. This is, a, a, this is from the Bulgarian Journal of Plant Physiology. Do you, do you read that one often? Probably not, right? But uh, the, this is a review, and the name of it is Animal Neurotransmitter Substances Are Found in Plants. Well, what does that mean? So, Neurotransmitters are, we could call them brain chemicals. And animal neurotransmitter substances are found in plants. So if you would eat plants, you might be giving your body the chemicals that it needs for your brain to be happy. Do you follow? And so this is an important point. This is from the University of Queensland. The study was conducted, and they found that fruit was a depression buster for women. What does that mean? That they found that women who consumed more fruit had lower levels of depression. Wow. This here is from the Journal of Neuropsychiatry of Clinical Neuroscience, and the title of this, this uh, article here is Depression and Fruit Treatment. And it says it's hard to see because it's so small, but it says depression is a common mood disorder affecting sleep, appetite, and libido. And it's also one of the manifestations of dementia and may lead to suicide attempts, particularly with violent methods. 
It says, research has shown involvement of serotonin. These are these neurochemicals, these neurotransmitters. The researchers have shown develop, uh, involvement of serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan in depression. And then it goes on to say, let's see if I can point it, and the, and the paragraph in the middle toward the top, it says up here, it says, there are some high content sources of serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan, which can provide the body with these substances. These include plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomato tomatoes for serotonin. Now think about that. These foods that are designed by the creator to make us happy are things like fruit. Isn't it interesting that God didn't say, all right, I do have food that I made to make you happy, and it's like a bitter herb that nobody likes. Instead, what is it? It's actually the food that humans naturally do like. Well, listen, if you're eating Twinkies all the time, you probably don't like apples and peaches, right? Because have you ever had it where if you have refined junk food and then you bite into a piece of fruit, it's like, ooh, that's not even very sweet. But when you stay away from the Twinkie for a while, you, you bite into a, a fresh Honeycrisp apple or the new one that came out, Evercrisp, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, right? It tastes fantastic. Or a wonderful, uh, you know, peach when it's fresh in its season. Or being down here in southern Arizona, uh, you know, like Yuma, you have the dates, right? Incredible. And these things potentially, actually research shows specifically that dates can potentially lower depression and lower your chances of diabetes. Dates can lower your chances of diabetes. Incredible. I put out a video on my YouTube channel. I was at a date farm down in Southern California. You can check that out at Health and Homestead. You can see the research on that. And so, but these foods God made in the package that he designed them. You say, Chad, dates are full of sugar. They are. They're like 70% sugar. And they don't spike blood sugar in diabetics. Even when a diabetic eats 10 dates, according to the research. That's a lot of dates, isn't it? But it's in the package that who made? God. You know, when you have 70% sugar and, and frosting on a cake, is that going to spike your blood sugar? Yes, it is. When you have 70% sugar in the date, it doesn't do it because it's the way God made it for you to make you healthy and happy. So we're talking about healthiness, happiness, and fruit, but not, also, not only fruit, but also vegetables. This is a study, the title of this study in the British Journal of Health Psychology is called Many Apples a Day Keep the Blues Away. Daily Experiences of Negative and Positive Affect and Food Consumption in Young Adults. What they discovered was that for every serving of fruit or vegetable that you consumed in a day, it would forecast how happy you would be that day, but it would also forecast how happy you would be the next day. And this is, it, the study was replicated, and this one was in the American Journal of Public Health. And on the bottom, it's how many servings of fruits or vegetables. And on the up, up and down on the left side, you have how, uh, how happy you are, your change in life satisfaction. If you ate zero pieces or zero servings of fruits or vegetables, you are at your least happy statistically. And if you added one piece, it made a tar hardly any difference. But two, three, four, five, six, seven... Eight servings of fruits or vegetables can make you make a statistically significant impact in your levels of happiness. This is incredible. So you get to choose how happy you're going to be based upon how many servings of fruits or vegetables that you eat, getting closer to that Edenic type lifestyle. And there's something called dyspepsia. We don't talk about that as much today. But what is dyspepsia? What's being a dyspeptic? Dyspeptic is of or having indigestion or consequent irritability or depression. So it's having gut issues that impact the mind. Now, I want to clarify, you may have gut issues and you have no pain. You don't have any diarrhea. You didn't even know you have gut pain or gut trouble. You have no pain, and yet it is negatively impacting your mind. And so just because you don't have stomach pain or diarrhea doesn't mean you don't have a form of dyspepsia. But let's read this. It says here, for a dyspeptic stomach, you may place upon your tables fruits of different kinds, but not too many, not too many different kinds at one meal. We were told in 21 Manuscript Releases, page 286, it would be well for us to do less cooking and eat more fruit in its natural state. 
Let us eat freely of fresh grapes, apples, peaches, oranges, blackberries, and all other kinds of fruit which can be obtained. And, you know, this probably isn't the best time of year for fruit, but it is amazing that we now can have many fresh fruit. Like I was just at the grocery store yesterday, and there's fresh mangoes, the manila mangoes, the little yellow ones. Man, those things are fantastic. Isn't it a blessing that you can have fresh fruit year-round now? It used to be you basically had, you know, fresh fruit in the summer, toward the end of summer, and then you had dried fruit maybe the rest of the year, or they'd have a few things like bananas in the store and, and maybe oranges and apples, but that was about it, right? But now we get fresh fruit all the time. And, well, I'll go a little forward. Now, why do I actually tell you about this? I am the least likely person on earth to be up here teaching you about this. Like I said, my very favorite food in the world was pork, and I was not interested in a plant-based diet whatsoever. And uh, then I, I began to, well, long story short, the, my diet changed. I had health issues, and I'm going to list some of those at the end of this, I believe. But I, I ended up coming down with depression. What happened? I was doing work in Iceland for a year, and because of the water we were drinking, I ended up coming down with stomach trouble. So did uh, Fadia, my wife, and so did my friend Nathaniel, who was working with us. We all came down with stomach trouble. I lost 30 pounds because of the water. Now, I was gaunt. I mean, just, just super thin and had this gut trouble. My friend Nathaniel, when he came, he was overweight. And by the time we left, he looked good. It worked for him. <laughs> Didn't work well for me. But I also came down for the first time with depression, but I didn't connect the two. I just thought it was the rough weather of Iceland, and so I was depressed. And then I went back to the United States, and for a whole other year at least, had probably just about the same amount of stomach trouble, even being away from the water. And then for the next eight years, I struggled with either depression or at least seasonal depression. And then after eight years of that, I was looking for some land. My wife and I, we love the country, and so we were looking for some land. And we, I think we were in either Missouri. Yeah, it was Missouri at the time. We were looking at some land. And one day we had, not exaggerating, 100 ticks on us, at each of us, on our pants. And so we got rid of it. And at some point I was bit by a tick, and a doctor friend said, well, let me make you a prescription for, for an antibiotic to, so, to make sure that you don't get Lyme disease. So I thought, okay, no problem. I took the antibiotic, and then I went into full-blown year-round depression. And I didn't know then about the research that I've subsequently looked into, but research has shown that for every round of antibiotics, every time you take a, a series of antibiotics, it increases your chances of depression by about 25%. And every two to five rounds that you take increase your chances of depression by about 50%. And think about this. What do antibiotics kill? Bacteria. Do they only kill bad bacteria? They just, it's like a, it's kind of like a shotgun approach. It just kills and it, and it doesn't really, you know, it, do, it doesn't choose who it kills. And so now, does this make sense in the context of what we've looked at? That those who have greater diversity of gut bacteria are what? Happier. And if you kill the bacteria, it ends up making it so you're more prone to depression. And so I then, then two years, so I had gone eight years with seasonal depression at least, and then the last two years, because two years in a row got bit by ticks and two years in a row took antibiotics, then I was in just chronic depression year-round. Now I continued to go forward. I was making documentary films. I was traveling the world. I was going around speaking, but yet I was totally depressed. It was rough. And my depression, people have different kind of, it manifests itself differently. For some people, they feel worthless. I never felt worthless. I didn't hate myself. But for me, it was terrible guilt. Guilt, guilt, guilt. I'd try to make my heart right with the Lord. I'd ask forgiveness for my sins. And I just felt guilty, 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 guilty. I would pray and I would pray. I would study my Bible Many times for hours in the morning, I'd spend time with Jesus, seeking Him, trying to make, I spent thousands of dollars trying to right the wrongs of my past, but I just didn't feel any peace. Sometimes depression is physiological. I had memorized, and I'm not exaggerating, over a thousand Bible verses, trying to fill my mind with God's Word, trying to make my heart right with the Lord, and, and I struggled. And later on, when my stomach healed, the depression went away. 
And even though for those two years I felt lost, when I came out of the depression, for 10 years I felt lost, but the last two were terrible, when I came out of it at the end, and I look back on that time period, I don't believe I was lost. I was still trying to go forward by faith, but I didn't feel saved. And you know what's a good news? The Bible doesn't say, by feelings are you saved. It doesn't say that, does it? It is not based on what you feel. Jesus, as he was going to the cross, did he feel like he was going to come resurrect from the grave? How do we know he didn't feel like he was going to resurrect from the grave? Because he said, my God, my God, what? Why have you forsaken me? He felt abandoned by God, but yet did he rise up from the tomb on the third day? Praise his name, he did. Our Savior is risen from the grave. He is our Savior. He died for your sins, even if you don't feel like it, but you believe it based on faith, you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest what? Any man should boast. It is not about your feelings. It is by faith that you are saved because Jesus died on that cross. And if you give your life to him, he can take all of your sins away. He already died for all your sins, but will you receive him by faith? And so, praise the Lord, what happened was I ended up reading something a quotation that I tried to implement in my life, a change of diet, and within two weeks, my depression went away. And I'm going to read you a quote that's similar, not the exact same quote, but a similar quote from a book called Counsels and Dying Foods, and I call this, this is my title for it, Resetting the Stomach. In many cases of sickness, the very best remedy is for the patient to fast for a meal or two. Not every day, just one time. Just go on a one day where you skip a meal or two. Now, if you eat three meals a day normally and you skip two meals, it's nearly a 24-hour fast. If you normally eat two meals a day and you skip one meal, it's nearly a 24-hour fast. So evidently, it's close to a 24-hour fast. One time, not all the time, just one time. In many cases of sickness, the very best remedy is for the patient to fast for a meal or two. Why? That the overworked organs of digestion may have an opportunity to rest. Then what? A fruit diet for a few days, not for the rest of your life, but a fruit diet for a few days has often brought great relief to brain workers. I was a brain worker, making documentary films, studying science, looking into these things, studying the Bible, and sharing these things. Many times a short period of entire abstinence from food, followed by simple, moderate eating, has led to recovery through nature's own recuperative effort. An abstemious or a simple diet for a month or two would convince many sufferers that the path of self-denial is the path to health. I implemented this, and within two weeks, my depression went away. It was incredible. And I didn't know why, because I didn't know all this research. Then I began to look into the scientific research, the scientific studies, and began to discover, wow, there's, there's a logical reason why this changed my life. And so just to kind of recap what this says is number one, how to balance your gut. Number one, fasting for a meal or two can let your organs of digestion. You can have inflammation in your intestines, and fasting can help that inflammation begin to settle down. We're going to look more at that when we talk a little bit about leaky gut in the final presentation today at 5.30. We're going to look at that when we look at foods that can cause anxiety, depression, and lust issues. We're going to look at that then and also anger problems. And then secondarily, after fasting, eat more whole fruits. Some people say, Chad, but what about diabetics? That's going to increase their chance of diabetes. By and large, that is actually not true. Here's a massive study from the British Medical Journal, one of the most prestigious scientific journals out there, a study of over 100,000 women and men. And this is consumption of fruit and your chances for type 2 diabetes, that solid black line toward the top where it says 1.0. That line is anything above it could potentially increase your chances of diabetes. Anything below it lowers it. Now, it is true that cantaloupe, notice that the reference is up and down, not just the green, but the reference. So for roughly half of people, it, half of people, it, cantaloupe or melons can increase your blood sugars and cause issues. But for half the people, it didn't do it. For strawberries, the vast majority of people will lower their chances of diabetes, and everything after that lowers your chances of diabetes. Oranges lower it. Peaches, plums, and apricots, lower it more. 
Grapefruit, more. Bananas, more. Apples and pears, more. Prunes, a prune is a dried what? Plum. It's a dried fruit. Is a dried fruit bad in this category for diabetics, yes or no? Strangely enough, it's even better than a what? A fresh plum. This is incredible. And then, after that, grapes and raisins. Notice raisins, dried grapes, are just as good for a diabetic as a fresh grape. Incredible. But think about it. God in this sinful world, because of sin, how could people consume fruit most of the year historically? Dry. I mean, obviously, fresh in the summer, but then after that, the rest of the year would have to be dried. And so people say, watch out, be careful, dried fruit's bad for you. I haven't found any scientific studies that back that up, that it's bad for you. I found just the opposite, that dried fruit lowers your risk of cancer, actually more than fresh fruit does. And I'm not saying just to eat, you know, dried fruit. That's not my point. But this is what the research shows. And we were actually told that we can eat more fresh fruit than is customary with best, with more dried fruit rather. We can eat more dried fruit than is customary with best results to health. And we're seeing that right here in the research. So I wouldn't worry about fruit. You might want to uh, avoid melons if you have serious blood sugar issues. That might be something. But otherwise, most, dried, most fresh and dried fruit is good for you. Eat more whole fruits. Number three, eat more whole grains. That would be whole wheat, bread, oatmeal, and other well-cooked grains unless you are one of the 6% of people that struggle with gluten. According to research, according to, I should say, Alessio Fasano, who's considered to be the top scientist in the United States and probably in the world on gluten, what he states is that 1% of people have celiac disease. That's an autoimmune disease that they cannot at all eat gluten or anything with wheat. And then there's about 5% of people that have either a wheat allergy or some kind of gluten intolerance. So that means about 6% of people struggle with it. If you're one of those six, avoid it. But for 90 plus percent of the people, you do totally fine with gluten. Um, you know, I, I could go on into more detail on that, but we'll just leave it at that. But you, if, if you can't eat gluten, then you can still eat things like quinoa, you can have teff, you can have amaranth. There are several grains, millet, that you can eat. You can still have grains, and some people believe they really struggle with grains. Most of those people would find if they thoroughly cook them and even dextrinize them, heating them on a pan before you actually cook them and just, like, getting them browned, and, and then you cook them, most people that struggle with grains will find that actually does the trick with their trouble with grains. Most people will find that. But after that, eat more whole vegetables. And when I say whole, uh, what, what, what I mean is non-refined. That's what we're talking about. So not taking the sugar out of a sweet potato, but eating the sweet potato. And uh, the next one, I'm going to show you some more research on late. But if you struggle with some of these issues we're talking about, try avoiding spicy food and eating a handful of nuts a day. No more unless you're very, very thin. If you're very, very thin, you can have more than a handful a day. But if you struggle with weight, any more than one handful a day is going to hamper your, your you know, if you're trying to lose weight. You don't want to have any more than a handful a day. And you don't, any more than a handful a day, you, get, you don't get any additional cognitive benefit, according to research. So just one handful a day is plenty. And somebody may find if you switch over to this diet, for the first several days, you might start losing energy if you let go of meat. And you'll say, see, I, this, this doesn't work. You lose energy. Wait a couple weeks. And you'll have more energy than you've had in years, maybe your entire life. When I switch to this, I began to have, I was 35 when I switched to this. I began to have more energy than I'd ever had in my life. I couldn't believe, even more energy than I had at 16 or 18 years of age. I began to want to run all the time. Not, not because I just, I, it's just because my body was like, run. And so I felt like running. And I had so much energy, I just didn't know what to do with it all. So if I had to go get something out of my car, I would run to my car. And then I had to go back to the house, I'd run to the house because I just had all this energy. It was incredible. It literally changed my life. And so, but if you go on a total plant-based diet, it is generally wise to take at least once a week or so a supplement of vitamin B12. But I want to close with this true story. This is incredible. This is from the Victor Valley Medium Community Correctional Facility in Adelanto, California. True story, this is the longest name they could have thought of for a prison. I don't know why they made it so long, but nevertheless... 
this is, uh, it, was in, it was in California, and it was a prison that was a man, a Seventh-day Adventist businessman by the name of Terry Moreland got a contract with what's called the CDC, but not the one you've been hearing in the news a lot. This CDC is the California Department of Corrections, not the Centers for Disease Control. So he got a contract to start a 500-inmate prison. He wanted to make a prison that would change people's lives because he knew about this gut-brain connection to a degree. He probably didn't use that term, but he knew it could change their lives if he changed their diet. And so this is what happened. The, they got a 500-inmate prison, and they allowed the people, they put two sides to the prison. One side would be on a standard meat-based diet. And the other side of the prison, physically separated, would be on a plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet. So they allowed them to choose what side they would go on. You could either go on the New Start program of a vegan diet, occupational training, Bible studies, and anger management classes. And by the way, there's Bible studies in every prison in America. So that wasn't a major factor, even though the Bible is a major factor. It changes lives. But meaning the, the difference was a diet because, you know, people study in every prison. And one of the government workers said, no way, no way. These guys would rather burn the place to the ground than go vegan. And so he said, okay, we'll give them the choice. They gave them a choice. And guess what percentage of these criminals of their own volition chose to go vegan? Take a guess. You say 55. I heard different numbers. It was 85% of these guys chose to go vegan. 85%. And you may say, like, Chad, why did they do that? You know, these guys are like, yeah, I'm vegan. You know? <laughs> I think it's in part because, you know what? Most people are embarrassed to be different, but not criminals. They're already different. <laughs> they don't care. They're like, whatever. Hey, man, if it works, if this helps my brain, if this makes me happier, if this gives me a better life, I'll give it a try. Why not? I'm in prison, right? What ended up happening? Now, there's something, a statistical measure called recidivism. Recidivism is a, is a statistical measure where with, they look at people, when you've gone to prison once, you're a statistic. And then when you get out of prison, you're another statistic. And then they just keep the numbers on how many people after going to prison the first time go back to prison the second time. And the number they come up with is called recidivism. So, for instance, if 50% of people commit a crime a second time, you have 50% recidivism. And what did they find? Well, at that time, while Terry Moreland was running this prison, the recidivism rate in California was 95%. That means 95% of people who commit a crime one time, when you let them out of prison, they commit another crime and went back to jail or prison. Incredible. While Terry Moreland was running this prison, the recidivism in, in this prison dropped from 95% all the way down to 2%. The average in the U.S. is 51.8%, at least at the time I got the statistic. This is incredible. Imagine taking 90 plus percent of people who commit crimes and they never commit a crime again. You know what they did? I interviewed one of the men who, who, who helped start this prison, and his name is Richard Bland. He was a man African-American brother who had marched with Martin Luther King Jr. He showed me a picture. He's like, there I am. That's Martin Luther King Jr. He said, everyone in that picture right there is dead now. Obviously, whether it was assassination or, or just dying of a heart attack, whatever it was, he's the only one alive. It's because he lives, oh, number one, he wasn't executed. Number two, he, he ended up what? He eats, a, he eats the diet that we're talking about. So he's lived a long, healthy life. But he told, so he ended up sharing with us, fascinatingly enough, so you think, okay, other prisons in, in California began to be excited, and people in prisons in California began to ask, can I get transferred over there? Because they knew the lives of the men in the prison were being changed, but then their families on the outside, the, the guys inside were witnessing to their families, their families on the outside were being changed. It was changing society. And so you know what they did? They shut down this prison. Evidently, prisons are big business. And big business, one of the best things for business is to have repeat customers. Yes or no? 
It's true. Anybody who's been in business, repeat customers are one of the best ways to make a living. And what would happen if almost nobody went back to prison in America if we changed their lifestyle? Well, you wouldn't need many prisons anymore. You could maybe drop the amount of prisons by 90% in America. We could go from one of the most incarcerated nations on the planet to being one of the least. But they shut this down. And it's really actually heartbreaking. But who would have ever guessed that by changing people's diet, you could change them from a life of criminality to making them good citizens? Now, in connection with Jesus, for sure. Because they were also giving the Bible studies, but all prisons give Bible studies. They still have 51% incar- you know, re- recidivism rate. So who would have guessed a diet could make a difference? Well, we were told in a book called Ministry of Healing. It says, wrong habits of eating and the use of unhealthful food are in no small degree responsible for the intemperance and what? Crime and wretchedness that curse the world. One of the potential main reasons for crime is actually having an imbalance of what is going on in your body, making you an unhappy person, and you may have heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Does that make sense? When you're hurt, you're more likely to hurt somebody else. But what if you are healed like these men? Healed people can help heal people. And that's what these men did. They began to help their own families on the outside. As they were healed, they began to heal others. And just a quick review of what it did for me in closing. This diet changing to this helped me with my achy joints. It got rid of my migraines. It it got rid of my hypoglycemia, my depression, my lack of energy, gave me more energy than I'd ever had in my life, got rid of my gallbladder issues. You can reverse gallbladder problems, even gallstones with this diet. And it got rid of my asthma and allergies. And like I said, sharing all these things sounds like a bad infomercial, like I'm making it up. But I assure you, this changed my life. And so I share this with you, not to tell you what you have to do. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to take a word that I say and do anything with it. And I love you just the same. And by the way, we shouldn't judge people for what they eat. I can sit down across from my dad, and he can eat his octopus, and I can eat my sweet potato, and we can enjoy each other's company. And I can still love them. And we should be that way together, amen? That we're loving and kind to each other. This is not being judgmental, but I'm sharing with you some of the latest research on how you, by getting closer to God's original diet, the diet of the garden of pleasure, can bring more pleasure and healing into your life. Let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study together from science and Scripture, your two books that you've given us, the book of of your word and the book of nature that we get to read as we look at nature all around us. We thank you for these principles that have been able to change lives like mine, like these men who went from a life of criminality to being good citizens by your power and by the simple, simple principles of your word. Lord, I pray maybe there's someone here struggling with some of these health issues, maybe arthritis, maybe depression, maybe anxiety or heart disease, diabetes. And these principles may be able to help them, Lord. If someone needs these things and you've put it on their heart, I pray that you give them strength to do it. But thank you that we can enjoy each other's company regardless of what people choose to do. We can all choose to be brothers and sisters regardless. But either way, Father, I pray that each one of us would draw closer to our Savior Jesus. For in his name we pray, amen. Just to let you know very quickly, we're going to be having a meal right after this. Then we'll be back at 2 o'clock for the gut brain, COVID, and other factors. We're going to look at cutting-edge research that's come out of late, showing us about the connection between the gut and the brain and COVID. And then we're going to look at 5.30. We're going to take a break between, and for those who want to, go on a walk. Uh, You can come with us on a walk. If you don't want to, you can take a break and just come back at 5.30. And then we'll look at foods that may cause anxiety, anger, addiction, and more. This, This one... I almost guarantee, unless you've listened to me before, you've never heard this research. So just want to invite you out to that. And uh, all right, I will let, would you like to come up and say anything, Pastor?